Bringing technology to education has made for interesting discussions since at least the era of radio education between the world wars. Typically, however, there has been much more talk than change. Classrooms today tend to resemble the past more than most public venues do. This isn't necessarily a criticism, since the heart of education remains the face-to-face -face interaction of teachers and students. Nonetheless, once more we can speculate whether a revolution may be coming in technology and education due to advances in software systems and neuroscience. The creation of virtual learning environments may allow education to reach more students with greater impact by communicating experiences in more holistic ways than language does. On the other hand, educational neuroscience is giving us an unprecedented look at how students learn so that we can tailor curriculum and instruction for maximum effect. Researchers Stephen Campbell and Catherine Patton of SFU are working at the cutting edge of these fields and are here to share their insights on Your Education Matters. Then, from looking at your research and writing, I noticed that you study math learning in virtual environments. I think that bears some definition for our audience, so would you explain what you mean by that? Well, yes, Paul. Um, virtual environments uh, basically are artificial worlds that are well known in the gaming community, but are becoming more uh, accessible to ordinary people for ordinary situations, for social interaction through virtual worlds like Second Life, for example. And when I first encountered Second Life, which was brought to my attention by our colleague David Kaufman, um, I was immediately entranced as a math educator, uh, mainly because going back thousands of years to the ancient Greeks, one of the fundamental philosophical questions is if the world is essentially mathematical in nature. And as a math educator, I tend to adhere to this view. And although it may be questionable and debatable in our own world, despite the effectiveness of mathematics in describing our physical world, uh, in a world like Second Life, this is a completely mathematically generated environment. So it is truly a Pythagorean world. Um, from that point of view, I was intrigued initially. And uh, looking at its potential from a point of view of distance education and uh, collaborative activity, collaborative learning, uh, it struck me as having enormous potential. And one of the things that was so interesting to me about this environment is that all of the objects within it are created basically using a mathematical toolkit. So here is an environment where uh, individuals, if they want to um, uh, be creative, they can use a mathematical toolkit in order to generate objects, alter their size and dimensions and their textures and this kind of thing, in order to build within this virtual world. So what better place um, for math educators to explore than a Pythagorean world such as this? So maybe we could also describe it as a simulation then? A word we're we're more familiar with in educational methods? Yes, well, uh, another area that I'm deeply interested in is in mathematical modeling and simulation. And indeed, the potential to be able to illustrate different mathematical models within a virtual environment also is something that I think has great potential whether it's exploring the motion of a water particle in the turbulent flow of a river falling into uh, a lake through a waterfall, um, or whether it was a system of differential equations that helps us to understand climate change. And these are the types of things that I think uh, lay in wait for us within this technology. And our tri-council funding agencies in Canada have believed in this line of research uh, by, indicated by their funding of your work, haven't they? 
Well, um, thus far our funding has been local to SFU, um, but in other aspects of my work which are looking at more the embodied nature of cognition and uh, the, the neuroscience methods that we can bring to bear in educational research, um, that has received some substantive funding from uh, national sources. So again, to summarize, for a person saying, it, why not just do math education research in classrooms? Would you once again summarize your reasons why you would want to go to a place like Second Life to do this research? Well, um, for me, I'm looking at it as uh, how can we bring education and educational research into the 21st century, into the information age, and to be able to take advantage of the new technologies and new ideas um, that characterize um, a, a rather new situation for humanity as opposed to, uh, say, the way it has developed over the past couple of centuries within the industrial age model. Okay. And Kate, you've been working through a graduate program at SFU in this area. How is your research connected to this realm of virtual environments? Um, while I do have an avatar and I acknowledge the uh, usefulness of virtual environments, I do have a concern and most of my um, research has been involved with education and the, the how, act, how affect is actuated in the mind and the body. And I do have concerns about the virtual world and that it, how, how does it and how will it and how well does it convey emotion in human interaction. There's been a fifth estate I've seen uh, that they've run over and over again about how encompassing these virtual environments are, Second Life specifically, about uh, people who've left their families to uh, go off with people they've met through virtual environments. Really quite remarkable how engaged affectively people can get through virtual environments. Have you noticed that in, in your work? Um, I, have, I have seen some similar programs on television, but I always have a uh, concern that um, we know from Dr. Roland McCready's work that we, give off that we give off energy and that that energy is positive and negative and that we are affected by people who are, we are in close proximity to and that when we um, communicate with other people we not only feel that energy but we also see their body language and we see facial expressions and that's how we interpret communication and, and I think a lot of those things are not as present in the virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Sen, the movie Avatar, which has been such a success in the last year, gets into this world of virtual environments in a way that's alternate to Second Life, right? Well, I, I think it uh, definitely carries the notion of a virtual environment and, and the notion of an avatar um, I into an extremum, uh, into an idealized point where you can actually become a living, sentient, feeling, emotive being within the context of a virtual reality. Um, and I think technology is certainly moving us closer and closer to this. Um, certainly not uh, with that degree uh, of um, uh, in, in any time soon, that's for sure. Uh, but the whole notion of augmented realities, I think, is becoming much more interesting, much more germane to what education will be facing in the 21st century. If you can imagine Second Life um, being mashed with something like Google Earth, for instance, um, where all of a sudden now you have a representation of the entire world and the buildings within given cities and, and can actually um, have access to information real time that is generated by countless satellites orbiting the earth about uh, ocean temperature and uh, salinity and uh, soil um, uh, crop uh, characteristics and this sort of thing. Um, what you have now is not so much a virtual reality but an augmented reality where you might even consider um, the possibility of being able to experience the world in a way that has never been possible before uh, and a world that is grounded in reality and real world observations and measurements. Um, with regard to the more kinesthetic and emotive aspect, as uh, technology progresses, we may be able to put on something similar to scuba suits 
which would um, be more responsive to our embo embodied reactions in real life. Um, the interesting thing about being within a virtual world is that you're still experiencing something. The experience for you is real, uh, just as the experience in this environment is real. Uh, so uh, that uh, leads us to some very interesting questions about um, the nature of experience and how it is that we're able to perceive and construct our reality. And this is an area where I think that uh, educational neuroscience and the neurosciences in general have a lot to contribute to us uh, in our understanding. Since you're interested, Kate, in affect and motivation, uh, do you think there's a payoff in terms of using virtual environments in education because it communicates in a medium that young people seem to be attracted to? Definitely. And uh, therefore, uh, it might be especially useful with students who are not succeeding at school who need a different uh, methodology to reach them. Exactly, and I'm, as a um, person who taught uh, English literature for much of my career, it would be fascinating for students who don't want to listen to someone read you know, about where Shakespeare lived and how he lived to create a virtual world where they could go as an avatar mm -hmm. into, a, into a virtual world that was created of the 15th, 16th century, and they could go where Shakespeare went and go to a play in the globe in a virtual world. I think that would be a fascinating. It has a lot of applications. It helps us that will uh, help individualize students. learning then, too. Yes. It helps us reach students who are not well served by our traditional models. Exactly. And uh, the downside, well, we need equipment maybe. We need, maybe there's some cost associated with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the beauties of this, Paul, is I, I think um, as uh, computer graphics uh, technology and um, uh, bandwidth uh, for internet access increases, um, that um, the access to these kinds of technologies is going to become more and more widespread, economical. Um, and, and the younger generation, the internet literate generation that is coming up, uh, will certainly not have a lot of the reservations about diving in, so to speak, as others might. Um, and one more thing, you mentioned the movie Avatar. And uh, if we take the story itself, of course, that's the extreme. But when we look at the technological accomplishments that uh, James Cameron and his colleague have been able to introduce in terms of performance capture, to be able to render the expressiveness of um, the actors themselves in such a compelling way, I think this will also help to mitigate some of Kate's concerns about uh, leaving the affective domain behind. Okay, thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. For more than 40 years, the Faculty of Education at SFU has been delivering academic programs that are innovative and responsive. Based on the academic research of our professors and the expertise of practicing teachers from your communities, our programs are designed to meet classroom needs. As a community, we're piecing together a successful education experience for students today and in the future. In many people's minds, there's uh, some kind of a disconnect between education, this human service profession, and neuroscience, which sounds like something more at the medical research lab. So, Sen, would you bridge for us educational neuroscience? How do these two disciplines come together? Uh, yes, Paul, that's quite right. Um, there does seem to be quite a large gap um, between, say, neurons' behavior in petri dishes and children's behavior in classrooms. And uh, a skeptic would be right to question, why should I have to inform myself about neuroscience in order to teach? Uh, teaches a much more humanistic activity and neuroscience, of course, much more focused on, on brain research, quite frankly. Um, but educational neuroscience, as we're conceiving it, is trying to break down what we believe to be an artificial division between body and mind, and in particular between the brain and the mind. 
Um, and this is a, uh, a, an old distinction that goes back a long ways. It's very, very deeply ingrained within our society and our institutions. And uh, e even in education, think of the gap between physical education and the rest of the curriculum. You know, sometimes it feels so there's really no connection there whatsoever. And yet in my research, uh, from the point of view of looking at mind and body as one thing and not as two things, the fundamental implication there is that any changes within our body and body behavior are going to manifest as changes in the way that we experience the world and vice versa. And so the key to connecting the neurosciences and education, in my mind, is to look anew at the notion of embodiment and how it is that our organ of thought, the brain, is implicated with the way that we think and the way that we learn. So um, this is really the fundamental um, presupposition upon which all of my research is based. I'll give you one simple example from the point of view of math education. Think of playground activities, sliding along the ice, you know, um, or coming down a slide or being on a swing or in a merry-go-round. Um, think of how that embodied activity and experience can lend itself to forming a foundation for mathematical concepts, such as circles or parabolas or planes and this kind of thing. So that's just a very quick, simple example of how embodiment becomes germane to education and therefore looking at how the brain is, is acting and behaving when thinking mathematically is something that has great interest. Well, I, I'm sympathetic to that point of view because language itself uh, is so much metaphor and if you don't have concrete experiences to base it on, so many of the terms we use end up having no meaning. Yes, and, exactly. And uh, I think one of the problems we have with education now is since children are getting so much of their experience through television, which is sensorially a pretty deprived medium, mm -hmm. they uh, don't have those metaphors as deeply seeded mm -hmm. as they should be or as they could be from children who grew up with more hands-on experiences. That's a very good point. And in your own career, I know enough about your own career to know there's a consistency in this line of research because you span science and the humanities yourself. I mean, your studies have ranged from science to philosophy back and forth throughout your academic career, am I not correct? Yes, yes I, <laughs> I, I did have some experience in imaging the Earth's interior in the exploration of oil and gas. And uh, that was my Pythagorean insight, uh, was seeing how mathematics allowed us to be able to make sense out of the world as we experience in an intellectual way. Now, Kate, you work with Sen in uh, the Ingrammatron in order to uh, diffuse the knowledge into settings where it can do some social good, uh, try and do knowledge utilization, as we'd say in the current parlance. Uh, would you give some examples of how you are taking the research that's going on in the neuroscience lab, the Ingrammatron, and bringing it to teachers in classrooms? Well, as part of my job as the Outreach Coordinator for the Ingrammatron, I conduct uh, numerous workshops for parents, uh, for teachers, for pre-service teachers, um, administrators, and also some for students, and basically um, explain to them as my area of expertise is the interaction between cognition and emotion, and talking to people about how emotion affects how we learn and what we learn, and helping people understand um, how emotions function, how they actuate in behavior, and also bringing about the um, the recognition in the field of education that we need to not just focus on cognition which we have for so many years but also to realize that emotion is has plays an integral part in fact a very important role in the whole process of learning and teaching and uh, I'm wondering uh, there's always a, a worry about fads and faddishness and silver bullets in education and I know that's a concern of yours I mean how do we gauge how far we can implement these notions and at what point we're extending ourselves overly much uh, when we're overselling what uh, the current state of knowledge in the field is. How do you talk to your groups about that? One of the things I talk about um, quite extensively is the whole idea of dispelling the neuromyths of brain-based education. And what brain-based education has done, it has, while it has created awareness of the neuroscientific findings, 
What we find often is that they've taken some of the findings and extrapolated them a little bit too far in what John Hall calls a bridge too far. And so what I would like to uh, help teachers do is to be critical examiners of uh, neuroscientific um, findings and research and to also participate in the two-way suite of educational neuroscience in, that, in participating in taking the findings of cognitive neuroscience and saying how, can, how do these apply to the classroom? How can we take the neuroscientific findings and make them into, rather than something that happens that's isolated in a lab, to something that is realistic and that involves the, the mind and brains of the teacher-learner as an interactive capacity? I think uh, maybe we need to step back and explain a little bit how neuroscience is conducted in a kind of mechanical sense in the grammatron. Could you give us some description of that? Oh yes, absolutely. You're not drawing blood, for example, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, one, of, one of the beauties of, uh, of life is um, that um, living organisms generate um, biopotential fields. And indeed, uh, in our species, um, if our brain ceases to generate what we will call brain waves, um, that is the legal uh, definition of, of death. Um, and indeed, uh, through monitoring brain waves, we found that brain waves are very deeply associated with different aspects of cognitive states uh, <laughs> beyond just life and death. Uh, for instance, wakefulness and sleep. Uh, for instance, between eyes open and eyes closed. When you're monitoring brain waves, the qualitative shift in brain waves and these uh, changes of subjective state is very salient. And um, consequently, this is the uh, avenue of choice in my lab is to study brain waves through electroencephalography, uh, which measures changes in voltage potential on the surface of the scalp in order to be able to get some insight into um, two main problems that, that we're focusing on right now pertinent to math education are math anxiety. How, how is it that anxieties can somehow, uh, as Kate would put it, hijack uh, um, the cortex in, in such a way that people become frozen? Um, and, and of course, this, this is something that we'd wish to mitigate in, in some way, but this should be also very salient in terms of its manifestation in brain waves. And from a point of view of understanding, to be able to um, uh, identify the different kinds of brain states and processes associated with understanding. Um, and there are many researchers working on this, uh, uh, just a, a wide, wide variety of researchers. Um, to mention um, Kalina Kristoff and uh, Adele Diamond at UBC, for instance, who are doing wonderful work in this area. Um, for, for our part, we're focusing on electroencephalography and eye tracking and uh, a wide variety of behavioral observations in order to get as much insight into these aspects of learning such as the aha moment, uh, for instance, which you can almost feel your brain shifting uh, when you experience uh, a moment of insight like that. Um, and, and the, the consequences of, of deep anxiety. You know, math anxiety is such a widespread affliction in so many. Uh, so we're really trying to get insight into how to alleviate the anxiety and uh, allow for the understanding to come in and fill that. Yes, that brings it back to your studies of affect, the anxiety point that he's making. Do, uh, when you're doing the outreach workshops, do people ask about math anxiety? Um. Not specifically, but they do ask about how emotions um, affect the learner and how motivation, which is very closely connected to affect, how that affects um, students. And of course, teachers have always seen motivation as one of the holy grail. If we could only find out how to motivate students, then we would have one of the keys to teaching and learning. Yeah, right. Uh, and finally, Sen, uh, I wanted to ask about the international context of this work. I know that you travel widely to talk about it. Uh, where is this sort of research going on and what sorts of institutes are you in communication with about educational neuroscience? Well, it's interesting. It's one of those um, areas where the time has come and uh, so many different uh, initiatives have emerged uh, virtually simultaneously. 
Um, there's uh, a, a new uh, neuroscience lab in uh, Homerton College at Cambridge, which is the education college there. Uh, Harvard has uh, been a, a leading force in this area, Kurt Fisher's work um, in mind, brain, and education, the International Society and Journal that has emerged from that. Um, there are initiatives that have been occurring in Japan and China um, and, the, and Singapore. Uh, Carrie Lee's uh, excellent work uh, over there. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there's just so much happening. Uh, we could spend a whole show talking about that, I'm sure. Well, it's, I think it's reason to feel good about the Tri Council and the fact that the Canadian federal government and others have been funding this research here in Canada at SFU. Yes. Thank you both for being with us today. Yeah. We'll be back in a moment. While much of the public discussion on education is taken up by arguments about accountability and high-stakes testing, education researchers continue to make remarkable strides in developing ways to teach a greater proportion of our students effectively, no matter what their backgrounds. The standards and testing movement has been playing out for 20 years with little to commend it, so one may ask why don't media and political figures who claim an interest in education reform become current? Demonstration and experiment in technologically supported fields such as virtual learning environments and educational neuroscience show promise and have the support of educators. It is past time to work together on substantive change instead of continuing with punitive approaches that look at learning in a superficial manner and see teaching as drill and rote. Thank you for watching Your Education Matters.